in today's episode of Space Base News. SpaceX's Starship SN8 passed the cryotest, but when it will finally fly? Starman just made its first flyby of Mars while the planet is closest to Earth in 15 years. Some rumors appeared about Boeing's failed Starliner test flight. A new space TV show The Right Stuff just came out. My name is Radim and welcome to the Space Base News. When will the Starship SN8 finally fly for the first time? On Wednesday, October 7, the Starship prototype SN8 was finally loaded with supercold liquid nitrogen. According to Elon Musk's tweet, it reached the strength of around 7 bar, which is enough for the upcoming highly anticipated 15 km flight. Elon tweeted that the test was a success, but clarified that a small leak opened up near the engine mounts, possibly due to differential shrinking. The very next day, they performed the test once again. At this time, it seems that every Everything went well, but nevertheless, day after that, SpaceX decided to repeat the whole thing once more, just to make sure. And Elon tweeted the ship passed the cryoproof. So when will the SN8 finally fly? As you may know, the cryotest is one of the few major milestones that each Starship needs to reach to become fly ready. Next, we expect to see three sea level Raptor engines being installed, followed by a static fire test sometimes next week. It's gonna be really exciting to watch because it's gonna be the first time we're gonna see more than just one Raptor engine firing simultaneously. And SpaceX decided to do not just only one, but two static fire tests. And we've just got some great news because two precious Raptor engines had already been spotted around the silent Boca Chica this morning on La Padre stream. Austin Barnard tweeted a great close-up picture of this beautiful Raptor serial number 39. So preparations for the next milestone are well underway. The question is, will SpaceX attach the nose cone to the Starship before or after the static fire? You can let me know in the comments below what you think, but personally, I think they not gonna risk RUD, which is always within the realm of possibility, at least for the first static fire test. Then it will make sense to add nose cone and repeat, especially if SpaceX plans to test the top liquid oxygen header tank, which the nose cone contains. I think there is a good chance all of this will happen next week, so I allow myself to speculate. We'll see the 15 km as an 8 hop in less than 14 days. This two weeks guesstimate also corresponds with Elon Musk's timeline of the upcoming Starship presentation. Last week he tweeted that the Starship update is coming in about three weeks and I assume it's gonna happen right after the hop, maybe with the freshly landed starship in the background of the stage where Elon is gonna speak. Starman just made its first flyby of Mars. I don't know what you were doing on Tuesday, February 6, 2018, but I was at work, locked at the toilet for more than half an hour, listening to David Bowie's Space Oddity, watching the first Falcon Heavy launch with Starman on board. Come on, don't judge me here. SpaceX made history that day. Nearly two years later, on Wednesday, October 7th, the Starman, sitting in driver's seat of Elon Musk's midnight cherry Tesla Roadster, made its first close approach with Mars. Starman passed the planet about 7.4 million kilometers or 4.6 million miles from its surface, but neither Tesla nor Falcon Heavy stage is sending any signals back to Earth, so unfortunately we won't be getting any pictures. But even if Starman could send us some Martian selfie, we wouldn't see much of the red planet. According to the astronomer Jonathan McDowell, at a distance of 7.4 million kilometers, Mars would appear to be about one tenth of size of the Moon as seen from Earth, so it would still look like a really really bright star more than a planet. And that brings us to the next topic of this video. Nowadays you don't have to be Starman to have a nice view of Mars. This month our planetary neighbor will be at its biggest and brightest for the next 15 years. That's right. If you wanna grab a telescope or you just wanna see the planet with your own eyes, just go outside in the early evening and look towards eastern horizon. You'll see bright orange fire star. It will actually be the brightest object visible at this time of the evening. You simply can't miss it. With the help of some binoculars, you should be even able to see planet's white southern polar cap. 
Technically, Mars and Earth were actually closest already on October 6th, passing by just only 62 million kilometers. But on October 13th, Mars will be at the opposition, opposite the Sun in the sky. That means Mars rises as the Sun sets and sets as the Sun rises. And that's why now it's such a great time to view the planet. Mars will still be about 8 times further away from us than from the Tesla Roadster, so it will also appear to us about 8 times smaller than to the Starman. But still, Mars won't be this close again until 2035. Rumors about Boeing's failed Starliner test flight you may remember Boeing's failed test flight of the Starliner orbital capsule, which happened last year in December. The launch went well thanks to the ULA's Atlas V rocket, but shortly after that it became clear that the spacecraft won't reach International Space Station at all. Some people call it partial failure. Jim Bridenstine tried to do some damage control and tweeted something like uh, many things went right that day. Well, as we know now, they had at least two errors that could lead to catastrophic failure. The body language of Boeing's employees during the mission speaks for itself. But how could Boeing, which is supposed to be the reliable established choice for NASA, let something like that happen? Well, some interesting rumors came up in the NASA Spaceflight Forum. Longtime member Woods170, who has some reliable sources inside NASA, wrote that the fact that Boeing did the lousy job was no coincidence. Just a quick disclaimer here, all of this is unverified though interesting speculation and I think it's worth telling. The commercial crew program, which Boeing won alongside SpaceX, is fixed price contract. As you may know, NASA awarded SpaceX about $3.1 billion, while Boeing received $4.8 billion. That's right, they received $1.7 billion more for the exact same job. But those are still pennies compared to money that all those old space companies used to make from the Coast Plus contracts. But those days are gone and Boeing knows that. Or maybe not. According to those rumors, they still expected they gonna get more money outside this fixed price. And their reasoning was basically their disbelief that SpaceX will be able to deliver working spacecraft for just only 3.1 billion dollars. So they expected SpaceX will have to indeed ask NASA for additional funding. So they were basically betting on SpaceX's potential failure so they could also ask for additional funding for the Starliner development. So basically they assumed or hoped that this fixed price contract would eventually turn into sort of pseudo cost plus contract like in the old times. Unfortunately for Boeing and fortunately for taxpayers and spaceflight fans, SpaceX delivered. So without the additional funding, they had to fly internally underfunded spacecraft which was nowhere near ready to fly. The funny thing is that even after this disaster, they still allegedly expected that NASA will pay for the necessary reflight. Again, it's just a speculation, but if that's true, I mean, no disrespect to hardworking engineers at Boeing. But if you guys in management messed up this way because of your planet size arrogance, I'm sorry, but it serves you right. But when Starliner will make its second test flight? Well, more bad news for Boeing, I'm afraid. They announced on August 28th that the OTF-2 mission would launch no earlier than December this year. But a NASA safety panel said that while Boeing was making good progress on the vehicle, it had doubts that it would be fly ready this year. So there is a fair chance the launch won't happen earlier than January next year. And after that, sometimes in 2021, the first crew mission should take a place. But just now, former NASA astronaut Chris Ferguson, who actually quit NASA for Boeing, and who's supposed to be the commander of the flight, will no longer be part of the mission. I'm not gonna cover this now. But Scott Manley did a great video about the situation, so if you want, go and check it out new space TV show The Right Stuff just came out. How many of you dreamed of becoming an astronaut when you were a kid? Guilty as charged. Well guess who also had the same dream? The astronauts. So you may be asking what separates them from us? What was the stuff that made them never gave up on their childhood ambitions and turned them into the real thing? Well, maybe it was the right stuff. The 1979 book by Tom Wolfe, which was alongside its movie adaptation a massive inspiration for a whole generation of engineers, scientists, including NASA astronauts. 
Now The Right Stuff is back as an 8 episode series on Disney Plus channel which premiered on Friday October 9th. I'm always getting excited and cautious at the same time when new space movie or TV show comes out. There were definitely some disappointing cases lately. But I've just seen the first episode and it's really not bad stuff. The premise seemed to be following the book. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Cold War was at full force and the space race between the United States and Soviet Union began. The first episode follows NASA's effort to find the best US Army test pilots and turn them into the first astronauts. Eventually they select seven of them, who are nowadays known as the Mercury 7. Four-time Space Shuttle astronaut Steve Smith said in an interview with Space.com that reading the book as a young man increased his commitment in the space exploration thousandfold, allowing him to persevere through initial rejections. Another well-known astronaut, Scott Kelly, who spent a year in space, wrote extensively in his great book, which I recommend to everybody to read, how life-changing the right stuff was for him. When he was aboard ISS, he reached out to Tom Wolfe to tell him that the reason he's an accomplished astronaut is his book, and how it helped to turn him from an 18-year-old terrible student who loves partying into a man who found his life's ambition. After reading the book, he decided to become a test pilot and maybe even astronaut one day. So if you haven't read it yet, maybe you should. It's never too late, I guess. The movie adaptation had some backlash from astronauts, namely from Neil Armstrong, who liked the filmmaking part but criticized the historical accuracy. But this is a TV series, so I guess you can say the creators have more time to tell the whole story. Before his death in 2018, Tom Wolfe signed off on the series and gave his full blessing. So let's hope that the TV series will come as close as possible to what the book was. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Space Base News. If you like the content I do, please make sure to subscribe, hit the like button and also don't forget to hit the bell button so you're gonna receive notification when I do the next upload.